the problem is that we've got some lovely theories of learning and, and ways of learning, but the assessment system hasn't really changed to keep up. But you do have students who are who whose spelling is so difficult for them that they can't use a spell check. You know, they don't even know the first two letters of the word. And if they get alternatives coming up, they don't know which one to choose. I'm I'm at home. I go with surprises, not prizes. I'm thinking on my feet here. So if there's any other professionals listening to me, don't shoot me. One of the things that we don't realise when we're working with an older student is it's the foundations that are missing. Welcome to the Qualified Tutor Podcast. I'm your host, Ludo Miller, and I'll be interviewing tutors and thought leaders from across the tutoring landscape to inspire, inform, and motivate you to become the best tutor you can be. The Qualified Tutor Community is a safe and supportive space for tutors who love to learn and grow. We offer training, resources, ideas, and a chance to connect with like-minded tutors. If you'd like to continue the conversation, join our Qualified Tutor Community at www.qualifiedtutorcommunity.org or find it in the show notes. Welcome, Hazel. We're really, really lucky to have Hazel Barnett on our podcast today because Hazel has just joined the four-part course with Manning's Tutors. And Hazel immediately set herself apart by showing the expertise that she was bringing to the table. And I couldn't let her slip through my fingers without bringing her on for a podcast and letting you benefit from her experience also. So what I've learned about Hazel so far is that after a background teaching in maths and chemistry in secondary school, um, Hazel decided to do an M.Ed., an M.A. in education, and then went um, to specialise in dyslexia, dyscalculia, um, and learning styles, um, not learning styles, learning theories of learning. Um, so the thinking around how we build um, memory, how we recall things. And then specifically, because of that expertise, Hazel was able to work um, with, the, with the children in her school on arranging access to exams. So access arrangements is a very specific area of of specialism to be able to ascertain what kind of access arrangements a student should be having for their GCSEs or A-levels. And so to be able to hear from you, Hazel, with your experience as a tutor since 1991, you told me, with, um, with your background in, um, in learning about how we learn, how we remember, and how to make learning as concrete as possible, because you told me that you're a lifelong learner and you've been learning, you know, taking on as much as you can, even since you've retired. And then, Hazel, this extra element of being able to explain to us um, how students are eligible for, for extra help in exams. Now, of course, we're not going to be doing exams the way that we used to this year, which makes True. it even more interesting to think about what we'll be doing instead. And so we want to hear about that also, about what are going to be the universal factors in, in preparing our students for exams so that even when things are done differently, we're prepared as tutors to give parents the signposting that they might need. So there's a ton there to talk about. And as you know, <laughs> I don't really know actually if I'm honest. <laughs> as you know, our first question is always just to warm up and, and sort of get to know you as a person is to ask you, Hazel, what kind of a learner were you? I was um, a very uh, conscientious learner. You could have said I was, said I was a bit of a SWAT. I, I just loved studying and I was very competitive and I wanted to be top of the class and I wanted to get top grades. And yes, um, I definitely learned. I had a very, very good memory when I was younger and that was such an asset. But I just memorised notes. and But I had a certain uh, degree of understanding as well because I went on to study science. So I could understand concepts. But sometimes I actually learned the methods in maths and then uh, the meaning came later, which seems the other way around for how we advise now. But um, 
I would say I was, I was a procedural learner more than a conceptual learner. Right. I really find that distinction very, very helpful. We, we talk about... Um, we talk about that distinction quite a bit, certainly um, a couple of weeks ago when we were speaking with um, with Judy Bryce about dyscalculia and we were talking about how important it is to build concept, but then sometimes you want the quick wins of the procedure, don't you? You just- A few months before the uh, GCSE, you have to go for procedure. Um, I mean, the, th the problem is that we've got some lovely theories of learning and, and ways of learning, but the assessment system hasn't really changed to keep up. So, uh, and one of the courses I did described our stultifying assessment system. So you can really promote good learners and all sorts of variety of bringing on their learning. And then they've still got to sit behind that paper and be timed and answer the questions that are set before them. So that, that it, it is tricky, but you do have to go for procedure for the last few months and old papers and everything for GCSEs, definitely. It's madness. There's, there's lots of conversation in the community, in the qualified tutor community, about what might turn out to be the improvements that might happen in, in, in our final assessments. Um, you know, if, if it is that we're being dragged away from exams, what's gonna happen instead? Um, mm. Could you talk to us maybe a bit about that? What, how do you think that we should be assessing our students? Well, I think um, the, assess the GCSEs used to be more dyslexia friendly than they are now. Um, I think we ought to go back to having a coursework component um, because that, that, sh that shows a particular strength in some students that might get exam stress. Um, for example, a few years ago, the English GCSE, um, you would be, you would do um, some, a controlled, controlled assessment. And I think it is good that when it's largely done in school under the teacher's auspices, rather than a lot done at home where you can have a lot of input and it, it can be a bit subject to, to sort of abuse as it were. Um, but English GCSE, you would test it on your controlled assessment, uh, an oral presentation and your exam. And it gave a, a much more balanced assessment. Um, I'm not sure I'm in favor of um, uh, scrapping exams altogether because um, my, my brother-in-law is, uh, is now a retired surgeon, but um, he, obviously did his, his very, very clever medical exams in a timed pr pressure situation. And I thought someone who can't take exam pressure, I don't think I want it operating on me. So there is a place for that to prove that you can function under pressure, but I think it needs to be broader. It would be good if we, I think, you know, this going back to the old way of learning. And in fact, one of the modules I did in the MED was um, about uh, constructivist theories of learning. Yeah. And, uh, um, they started off by talking about the transmission model, which was the, the model of education that I was um, educated under. Your classroom was 30 empty vessels to be filled. Ah. Um, and that's the transmission model. But now the constructivist um, uh, model looks at the significance of prior learning, the, the student's personal framework of understanding and builds on what's already there, um, rather than just seeing the child as an empty bucket that you just pour stuff into. So, so that's sort of assessment for learning, isn't it? And that's what we do mm. with tutors all the time. We're always yeah. looking to see exactly where they're up to, find those misconceptions and those gaps and, and, and adjust them. But I actually thought that the constructivist theory was more about partnerships in learning. Oh yeah, and absolutely. Socio-constructivism, yeah. Communities right. of learning and all of that, yes. It's all coming back to me now. It's all been so long, <laughs> I need to be reminded. So, so let's talk about the way that you were working as a SENCO in schools and, and the practical guidance that you might give for somebody who was wondering whether one of their students should be having access arrangements for exams. Okay, so when I worked in the school, I worked as SENCO, Special Educational Needs Coordinator in the secondary department. Um, and then I was so concerned that children who I could see had, I'd studied dyslexia at level seven, part of my master's, and I could see children who had dyslexic traits, and um, but they, they couldn't afford to pay 600 pounds for an ed psych. Um, so I wanted to offer them something that I could do. So I started to do assessors courses and uh, this kind of thing and, and started to assess for access arrangements. Um, but that was when you, you didn't have, you had to, have studied it at level seven, but then the, they raised the bar, JCQ, to say you had to do 100 hours at level seven um, 
to be able to be a qualified access arrangement assessor, or you could be someone that had an assessment practicing certificate, or you could be an educational psychologist. So um, I sort of upgraded my, my skills. Um, so everybody who qualified, who qualified for access arrangements in our school would get them because I was there to, you know, you had to, when, if you're presenting a case for access arrangements, you've got to have background information but you've also got to have a psychometric assessment, which means you run tests that give you standardized, score, standardized scores, which give you, um, uh, they, they take into account the age of the child. So um, if you had a standardized score of 50, um, sorry, 100, then you'd be on the 50th percentile. You'd be right in the middle of a normal curve. We did lots of statistics and this kind of thing, normal distributions. Um, so standardized score 100 is a 50th percentile. Um, but to have um, to, get, to qualify for access arrangements, you have to have a standardized score below 85, right. which is the 16th percentile. So it means you're in a, a typical group of students of, of one age group. Um, you, you and you took a, a sample of 100, then the children in the bottom 16, as it were, score wise, would qualify for access arrangements, but it has to be the right test to um, release the right access arrangements. Um, an access arrangement is an arrangement allowed by the exam board. Um, if you have a learning difficulty, that will create a, a level playing field for you, um, that you, you might have slow processing speed, but you might be very, very good at concepts and understanding, um, but you can't finish the exams. So um, you never get the grades that you deserve. Um, so when you fill in what they call a form eight, um, when you apply to the um, to JCQ, you fill in basically um, a section A or part one, I think it's, is now, which is like history of need, history of provision, current difficulties, current provision. Um, and then you, the assessor assess it, the assessor has to be working within the, the, the center, the exam center or closely associated. And that's my role now, I'm self-employed, closely associated. Um, and you have to have a standardized score in your psychometric assessment um, below, 80, below, 85, below 85. So for extra time, I'd use tests of um, processing, um, processing speed, phonological processing. That's phonological awareness is awareness of, of um, sounds within words. And that goes into the whole area of dyslexia, which I could speak for hours on, as you can imagine. Um, but you don't need a dyslexia assessment for access arrangements. You need um, scores below 85 in the re relevant tests. If you're looking for dyslexia, um, you like the, the suite of tests I use, um, they test uh, literacy skills, that's reading, writing, spelling, a phonological processing, the awareness of sounds within words, a shortened, short and uh, short term and working memory. Right. Short term is just what you remember straight away uh, when, when it's said to you. Working memory is holding on to information long enough to do something with it. So that's assessed by digits forwards and digits backwards. It's really, it's an auditory memory as opposed right. to a visual memory. So you, you read out the numbers and they say it back to you and then they have to say it back to you backwards and that's working memory. Uh, various processing speeds you can test. Um, but if you were looking for dyslexia, you would also test their underlying ability, right. which could be verbal or nonverbal. And if right. there's a big gap between underlying ability and uh, literacy attainment skills, that could be an indicator. Although it's it's not a favourite model with uh, professionals now because um, you can be dyslexic and, uh, uh, and low ability. So it, there's more to it than just an uneven profile, you could say. That's exactly what I wanted to ask you about. In my mind, what I'm imagining is a Venn diagram. And I love Venn diagrams because I love thinking about how the various factors overlap. And it seems to me that what you will have been assessing for is to try to isolate those areas that will limit a student's ability to access the material Absolutely. more fairly. So, but then you've got this underlying factor of ability and of a student's mm. prior attainment. So you're looking for that lowest 16%, then yeah. you're looking to see what might be holding them back from performing better. Yeah. Then you're seeing if you can support in some of those specific areas so that they can perform 
above that 16% of the lowest. Absolutely. Right. Yes, exactly. And, and uh, practically, what does that do for students? Well, it, it really um, uh, improves their confidence. Um, and I've written a few notes down here. And one of them I, I wrote about learning difficulties that um, obviously, obviously learning difficulties often should manifest uh, early, earlier on or should be picked up if they're there earlier on. Um, and what I say about learning difficulties is we, um, we strengthen them by interventions and we accommodate them by access arrangements. Oh, very good. So uh, children who um, maybe have got, you know, dyslexic type profile and were, were struggling with French, they would be withdrawn from French and go to a literacy support group and um, which I would run with my colleague and we'd look at their learning profile and we would target their weak areas. For example, if they were had poor working memory, we would do lots of memory training. Um, if they were poor spellers, we do lots of spellings and phonics and stuff. Um, but you sometimes get to the end of year nine or year nine and you think, I've worked really, really hard in every way on this child's spelling, but they still have got a standardized score below 85. So at that case, then you bring in the accommodations. Um, what do accommodations do for a student like that? How will they factor um, it? It means, uh, yeah, if you've got that low standardized score, but you also have to have um, bizarre spellings which don't re resemble the target word, it's got a little bit more complicated, but um, they will qualify for a, a laptop with spell check enabled. Ah, very good. Or a scribe. And then will um, they lose points because they Well, this is another points. very important issue. Um, yes, you can lose some of your spag marks, spelling, um, punctuation and grammar okay. yes so you have to weigh one thing against another but it, you can even make it even more subtle than that you can have your spell check on but your grammar check off on your computer ah. so you need some really clever technical people to prepare the laptops make sure they're clean and there's no other information on them and turning different aspects off for for the child um, and then you have to fill in a, a laptop cover sheet what you've done uh scribe cover sheet and all that kind of thing um the first port of call would be a laptop because the exam board likes to promote independence. And actually, it's easier to run in a big school, in a, you know, in a school setting where you have to provide extra rooms for children with access arrangements if it's a scribe or a reader or something. But on a laptop, they can be in with the whole cohort. So it makes it easier to run. But the most important thing is they want to promote independence in the student. But you do have students who are, who, whose spelling is so difficult for them that they can't use a spell check you know right. they don't even know the first two letters of the word and if they get alternatives coming up they don't know which one to choose so for someone who has severe dyslexia they would likely to have a scribe yeah right. it's not enough help for it to make the difference that it's needed you know um we've done we had a lovely podcast with nina jackson who specializes in special educational needs and um she calls it living and learning difficulties and uh, she talks about how technology can be used to, to sort of leverage the, the differences and help, uh, well, inclusion to help students cope in the classroom. And she, she, she's a big advocate of reader pens and reader apps um, and voice notes and anything that will help a person get their ideas down, partly to support their mental health. You know, you're talking about confidence and it's so much more than that, isn't it? Because a person can feel so disenfranchised at yes. first, in a learning community where they can't show what they know. Absolutely. And so to... Oh, I, well, another story has just come to my mind. Come on, um, uh, my, my, my husband um, is an A-level, well, was an A-level teacher. He's more into admin now being vice principal, but he taught a child who was... Um, there's, there's a framework in one of the dyslexia books. It's by Gavin Reed. He's quite one of the top people in dyslexia, as it were. Um, and he ha he goes with the input cognition output framework for learning. So with dyslexia, you can have a bit of blockage in the input, which is reading, or the, or the output, which is writing. But your cognition stage, where you're forming your concepts and your understanding can be really, really strong. Yes. And this is where the access arrangements come in so well. He, ha he had a child who couldn't get anything down on paper just could hardly write at all, but was absolutely brilliant at history. Ended up in Cambridge and doing really well at Cambridge. So if he hadn't had his access arrangements, you know, it's removing the obstacles to dis display your knowledge, demonstrate your knowledge, but it must be a level, level um, playing field. Oh, it so must not be, um, to give you an advantage. It must not compromise the assessment. Um, and in fact, um, I can tell you, the definition of a disability is um, it's a long, it's a substantial 
impairment that has a long term adverse effect on day to day activities. That's the definition under the Equality Act of 2010. So um, you have to, for someone to have an access arrangement, they have to fulfill all those that criteria. You ask yourself, is it substantial, more than minor or trivial? Um, is it long term, more than a year, I think they say? And does it have an adverse effect on their day to day life? And that's education. So right. um, if you can, so when, someone's borderline and I'm thinking shall I have I got enough normal way of working evidence and enough history of need enough background in evidence and sometimes you have the parents putting pressure on you to get these access arrangements and you have to it's quite you know you have to maintain your integrity and, and have wisdom with it really um but I I just I flag that up I say is can I really say that this is a substantial impairment that's had a long-term adverse effect on day-to-day -day activities I think this is my question. How would you know that it wasn't poor teaching? If a student came to you and he'd been persistently, I happen to know a couple of students like this and they were pulled out of their schools because it was not a good school. And, um, and the, the, the teachers in the school were not effectively supported by their leaders. So there was no way, the behavior wasn't good enough for the children to learn to write. Um, and so those children, those children have persistent gaps in their education would they be eligible for access or would it be something else uh it's, it's a bit tricky because um the def there are several definitions of um uh, dyslexia and they've got different aspects to them but one of them is that um the they fall short in their literacy attainment um even after good intervention ah despite good teaching they're still not making progress. Right. So that is a problem. Um, I think because I've known the children in the school I worked in and I knew the teaching was good, I knew that they were genuine learning difficulties yes. and, not, and not poor teaching. So that is a tricky one. Um, you see, what, what I said earlier about dyslexia is um, it can be that there's a, a difference between the underlying ability and the um, literacy attainment. But the other things that Ed Sykes would look for, or some one, one that I read a report, would be, um, do they have an underlying processing difficulty? Right. And do they make mistakes typical of dyslexics? In uh -huh. other words, reversals and that kind of thing. So those are the kind of things I'd look for. And the, and the processing side of things is not teachable, really. So even if someone... Um, you know, has been poorly taught and their literacy was low, but you saw that they got fantastic working memory, fantastic phone logical awareness, fantastic visual processing speed. You, it might flag up to me that this is this needs an intervention. It, it's not a basic intrinsic feature of their profile sort of thing. Very, very nice. So we're talking about these two. I'm thinking on my feet here. So if there's any other professionals listening to me, don't shoot me. <laughs> oh, no. And, and we know that we know that it, these are grey areas that we're talking about and they're so complex and every 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 student is different. So the best thing we can do is share our knowledge so that people can make their own individualized judgment. So I think yeah. that's where I was going next, which is. Um, so you've given us this lovely tool of thinking about intervention and accommodation which are sort of the two tracks that you'd be supporting a, a student with any sort of special educational need, um, but even one who didn't meet the threshold, those are the two things you'd be thinking about. So, so how would a tutor go about signposting parents or even a school if they find themselves working, you know, as, 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 as a tuition partner inside a school, how would they, how would they signpost to support this student to make sure that they had the best arrangements? Um, I, can't, I can't really say a good answer on that, if I'm honest, because I haven't really been in that position. I think, um, as I was saying to you earlier, it can be a bit awkward um, if the school is not particularly in favour of tutors, which we know can happen, because they, they might feel threatened that their teaching is not good enough and needs supplementing, or they feel that it's not fair that people who can afford it have tutors sort of thing. Um, I suppose that, I mean, a parent should always be able to speak to a school about their concerns, but um, access arrangements would, for me, um, when I was SENCO, would always be triggered, and, and now my colleague uh, who's SENCO, she'll do that part of the job, would always be triggered by um, teachers' expression of concern. 
a long time ago we had an expression of concern form um, which they would fill in and give to me and now I take an email as adequate print it off and put it in the folder you know and that will usually and if I get three expressions of concern from teachers that the child is not not never finishing a test then I would um, test the child um, but if a parent um, spoke to me then that would still be an expression of concern but I take it wider to um, email all the teachers saying anybody else seeing this and then gathering a bank of evidence of which a parental concern could be part of it yeah but I think in the old days that you could go and get an educational psychiatrist report with some standardized schools below 85 bring them in and then they would take that and that would be enough for access arrangements but now um, the reason when I do my access arrangements I have to have the uh, background information because even if I get scores below 85 and there's not the normal way of working evidence it's you know and people pay for it um, it's a waste of money so if a, if a parent thinks well, I'm going to an ed site get the score below 85 bring it into the school they've paid a lot of money and then the school says um, sorry we don't have the background information then that's wasted and now we've got the extra thing that they really like um, their assessors to be working within the centre or closely associated. So how would somebody find an assessor like you who if they weren't working because what you just told me is that an expression of concern could come from the tutor to the parents and into the school and that this and that could trigger the kind of conversations that might make sure that this student who might have been overlooked might then get the attention that they needed so all of those things we understand but then if we needed to speak to a professional and there wasn't one on site how would we find somebody with your level of expertise well i would imagine that every school now has to have one i i, I think you know i think when um uh, they they changed the regulations to you had to do this hundred hour course. It's called CPT three A. Um, it's a combination of something called CCET, which is Certificate of Competence in Educational Ten um, Testing, and then the three A is Access Arrangements Assessor. I think they got lots and lots and lots of people trained up. Oh, um, I mean, I, I worked in the independent sector, so I, I'm not able to say what happens in the state sector, but right. certainly I think lots of people went on that course. Uh, my husband works in an independent school. He one of his staff trained up with CBT 3A. Um, yeah, I think loads of people, they just trained lots of people up in internally. But so if you've got an ed psych who's got a close relationship with the centre, they can, you know, we've, we've got an educational psychologist who, who works on um, assessing children that um, I'm not able to, and more complex and, and going into autistic spectrum disorder. So we've got one closely associated with the centre. Um, she could probably do the access arrangements as well because she I works think, with the centre. Yeah. I would imagine most schools have got some access to an educational psychologist or someone internally trained up. Yeah, fantastic. I and would you've, guess. You've named for us some of those courses. So if anybody listening wanted to go off and, and, and sort of explore this, this path, professional development, that's also really interesting. Thank you. Let's wrap up with one more area, which you and I have spoken about before, which is study skills. Will you share with us some of your experience and expertise, please? <laughs> Yes, I right. will. I will. Yes. Um, yes, I just posted a few points um, how I would prepare children for exams. And uh, we had lots of posts with different types of techniques. Um, but I, I summed mine up by saying be prepared, um, you know, to be as prepared as possible for an exam will reduce the stress because you've got the confidence that you actually can cope with the stress and answer the questions that were there. So I, I posted some revision techniques. Um, one thing that I've learned, and I can't remember exactly where I learned it from, but um, if you if you put your information in a different form, then it really helps you to process it and it helps you to get it into your long term memory. And um, I heard a phrase recently and uh, um, Julia said earlier that it comes from Ofsted, but I heard it through the school's partnership tutors. It says um, learning is a change in the long term memory. So um, all of, in all our teaching and learning, we, we're wanting children to get students to get um, information into their long-term memory. That's right. And uh, one way you can do this is to put it in a different form. Yeah. Um, for example, you might have some text, but you could turn it into a mind map, which of course is Tony Buzan's, I don't know about yeah. pronunciation, that's his, uh, he originated that, he initiated that. You could make a poster. Um, you could cut up an article and, and put it back together again, um, because that requires you to read it. 
Um, it's very interesting. Something came to me from my own experience in this. Um, I used, a few years ago, we, uh, as a family, we were all trying to memorise the song, The Twelve Days of Christmas, and get the order right. And I got it, and I managed it. And I always used to learn things in a very linear way, like one after the other after the other. And I got it, and then I thought, I, I was in the Christmas quiz this year, and I thought, I've lost it, I don't have it anymore. So I went online and I saw a picture of the 12 days of Christmas. I thought, what I need to do is group them. And there right. are many, many, many memory techniques, but one is grouping. Yes. So I thought, I'm going to put them in groups and then I'm going to be able to remember them as groups. And it actually had a, um, a picture with four on the top, four in the middle, four at the bottom, lovely little pictures. And I just looked at them for a few minutes and I thought, well, I know the first five. And then there are the two white birds in the middle. And, they, and G comes before S, geese and swans. And then there's somebody kneeling down, that's made to milk. And, and then there are four on their feet at the bottom. And it was ladies dancing, lords are leaping, pipers piping, um, and drummers drumming. Although the last line comes out in different order in some versions. But I just thought, isn't that amazing? I tried so hard to just learn it as a list. And I saw this picture with it illustrated and grouped. And I could learn it within a few minutes. That's so, so putting great. something in a different in a different form or a yeah. visual form yeah. can really, really help. There's so many layers there because, I mean, I, I read that the American Psychology Society say that each time a piece of information is recalled, it becomes better embedded and easier to find next time. So I'm actually thinking that the memorization that you do in a linear way was then reinforced by the image yes. and the technique of the groupings and the yes. fact that your mind's eye you can go back to those the pictures at the bottom um and then you can refer it back to the song which is of course a fantastic way yes, to learn absolutely um, all of those things together are what we're doing really because you mentioned that you did a course recently about hands-on learning sensory yes. learning did Mul multi-sensory learning multi-sensory learning can i can i pivot you into that because i'm so curious well, I did two professional development courses in 2020. One was dyscalculia and maths difficulties, and one was multi-century learning. And I did all the, um, uh, the reading, I did the assessments, I passed it. But of course, I haven't used it yet. I was basically preparing myself for wanting to be a better tutor. And I thought I really want to be a multi-century learning tutor. So um, it's... Great, you've made an assumption. Why did you want to be a multi-century learning tutor? Because I'd read lots of things about how effective it was. Right. Um, the funny thing is, the old theories on learning st styles, like the, I used to do the VARC, visual auditory, yes. um, read, write, visual, and audio, they're out of favour now, your, because they, they, this course really, really spoke that, uh, that there wasn't evidence for those, but very yes. much in favour of, multi-sensory learning is different because you're using your senses at the same time, and you're yes. using it in a very targeted way, yes. so it, the, you won't be able to see this on the podcast, but I've, in, I've invested yes. in this, I've got a student at the moment, a math student, a private student, and she finds it really, really difficult to learn her tables. And I've had students like in this in the past, and I've never cracked teaching tables okay. um, for children um, with dyslexia. Yeah. Um, and I mean, just doing a grid and filling it in, and they all like um, Judy said, it's no point in just just being a rhyme, you know, if it's got no meaning behind it. So I've invested in these. Um, and it's called turntables, and it's from a company called MultisensoryMatters.com. We're all looking um, it up as you speak. <laughs> a very nice lady because it didn't come through so I had to phone her I think it's a one-person business she was ever so sweet I said I paid on PayPal but it hasn't arrived so I'll put one in the post straight oh, away how nice I love those businesses but you see okay. you've oh. got the visual okay all of the 10 times table in. are in red in pink so when I'm working again with my students um when we get back together again I'm going to see if she gets on with these because You've got that on one side, but you've got like the D Hold square. On. Hazel, let me describe what you're showing me. It's a card with a pink border. It's a yellow card with a pink border. At the top, it says 10 times 10. And underneath, you have a 10 by 10 grid. So you're showing me an array. So I can see it. I can see the quantity that 100 is represented. And I can see that it's 10 across and 10 down. So you're showing me the meaning as well as the sum. Okay. And on the other side, you've given me the answer, which I yeah. know is 100. Yes, exactly. So if you were doing your... Um, I haven't tried these yet, but they seem to me from the principles of the course to be quite... to have some um, 
promise. Oh, this is so, a difficult one. You're showing me eight by six, but what's nice about it is I can see it's a rectangle. That array that's six by eight is a rectangle, isn't it? And yes. so and so you'll you'll do work with the student about you'll show them that the square numbers eight times eight will be yes. will make a square. Where in fact, I did a, a, t a task on that in my in the uh, maths one where I um, uh, where I got them to make squares um, like I gave them various numbers and they had counters to see if they can make squares with that number. So they had a worksheet with a an array of numbers with the square numbers and non square numbers. They say take that many counters, make a square with them. I can't. It's not a square number. So that's quite a nice task. Um, but, so all of these six times tables are blue and the student I'm with absolutely loves colour. So I, I'm not that's not tried sound. and tested, but I like the fact that there was meaning below, not just a number bond. Um, so a number bond is the eight and the six with a eight multiple times six. Eight yeah. Right. So yeah. So it's, it's illustrated not, and you pick it and you pick this up so this is supposed to be the, <laughs> the using your your sense of touch and movement fabulous. but um if i had time i could go back over all the fantastic tasks and teaching it from these two modules but um i've only got a vague memory of them so i need to look at them before well, i could you know pass what? them maybe on maybe we'll plan maybe we'll plan a workshop and we'll do that together because i'm sure it would be so well appreciated you know um i do pegboards i really love when i do hands-on learning i sort of I go through the children's toys and I grab whatever I can find. So we were doing cards today and we were doing snakes and ladders because of Judy's suggestion. Yes. And I've got a whole stack of pegs over here. And sometimes you just make them count them just to get an yes. idea of number in their mind, don't you? I yes. had some time where I had, um, <laughs> um, we made a giant number line on the floor because I saw that my eight year old student didn't understand how number worked. Mm. And, and he'd been practicing read counting to 100 because that's what the teacher did, but he'd never seen 101 and he didn't know how 111 was written. So there were all that there was all that work in just building those foundational concepts. And one of the things that we don't realize when we're working with an older student is it's the foundations that are missing. And if we can go right back there, um, mm. especially I mean, you heard how Judy said it, that she feels that the best maths teachers should be in early years. Yes. Yes. And that's what manipulatives do, isn't it? It gives us yes. that Well, when, when I did the uh, maths course uh, with the MED, um, we did this construct, um, and I think it was by an educationist called Jerome Bruner. Have you heard uh -huh. of him? Yes, yes, yes. You probably know a lot. Yeah. You probably know. It's the Inactive Iconic Symbolic Framework. Right. And it's the, it, we unpacked that and made lots of sort of mini frameworks, constructs out of it. Um, but his theory was that maths is learned through this process of inactive, iconic, symbolic. So inactive, you start with manipulative rules. You do the one-to-one -one co correspondence. You're counting things, aren't you, when you start your maths? And then you go on to the iconic, which is where you, um, you might have a picture of the manipulative or an Im imaginary picture in your mind, like three apples. You might not have the apples there, but you'd be thinking three apples plus four apples equals seven apples, et cetera, et cetera. And then when you get up to a, a more sophisticated level of maths, then you're in the symbolic That's and you right. can work with algebra and you can abstract meaning without having concrete associations. Then. We have a, a but parallel. the thing is that some children still need to be in an active phase much higher up. And I completely agree with Judy saying, you know, I, I've I've been in maths lessons. I used lots of manipulatives and games and things when I was teaching classes. Um, but we, why do we take those out um, so early? And I read in one of the courses, I think it was someone called Miles, I think. He said dyslexics, they do before they name. So oh. he was really encouraging, and you know, not to put names or even, you know, the place value or anything, but get them to do before they name. And that was a powerful way of teaching them. Two things about that. Number one is because they'll spot patterns, won't they? Yes, absolutely. So they'll know that 10 more than 26 is 36 because you've shown them 16 and six and they'll yes. begin to predict patterns and then afterwards they'll explain why. And you have yes. to let them take those leaps. But then the other thing is where you're quoting Bruna. So 
we have a, the, the way that we talk about it when we teach maths mastery is CPA, concrete, pictorial and abstract, which is exactly yes. what you just I've heard that, yes. It's easier terms. Um, yeah. Because yeah, so it's based on that, yes. It's based on that, that's right, because again, apples, pictures of apples, and then the number three. That's what we can cope yes. with. Um, yes. So, so I'm going to wrap up here and I'm going to thank you so, so much for a few things. Modeling this sort of, you see, because the title for our workshop on special educational needs is Barriers for Learning. Yes, that's what we did all the way. How do you dismantle the barriers to learning? Where is the barrier? That's what we looked at on the dyslexia course. Is it in the individual or is it in the environment? But of course oh, it's somewhere in between. Wow. That's so profound. The way that we love to talk about it is that our natural state is learning. And yes. anything that's slowing that down is a barrier that we need to plan for, either through access or through intervention. So mm. I've learned so, so much from this session and I really look forward to the next time that we get a chance to do this. I'm sure that our listeners have enjoyed it as well. Um, and I will thank you so much. And I hope that you find the rest of the course um, aligned with your learning and I hope that it makes a massive difference to lots of our students thanks for oh, well, I'm so enjoying the course I'm learning so much and, and I just get I'm so uh, stimulated by being in a community of people who are passionate about education even though I'm quite old I'm still passionate about seeing children learn thanks so much Hazel thank you <laughs> okay see you soon bye, then. bye. Thanks for listening to the Qualified Tutor podcast, where tutors share their expertise to support the tutoring community. If you'd like to continue the conversation, join our Qualified Tutor community at www.qualifiedtutorcommunity.org or find it in the show notes below. We exist to connect, share and learn with you because tutoring is a small job that makes a big difference.